Hello, everyone. Good evening. Welcome. I'm Pam Franks. I'm the acting director of the Yale University Art Gallery, and it's so wonderful to see you all here um, as we, we kick off a very exciting weekend. Tonight's lecture is our annual Oswaldo Rodriguez Roque Memorial Lecture and is also the keynote address for a symposium that will be held tomorrow in conjunction with the exhibition Art and Industry in Early America, Rhode Island Furniture, 1650 to 1830. This exhibition is based on more than a decade of research, and we're truly honored to present it here at the Art Gallery. The exhibition, publication, and archive were made possible by major support from Lulu and Tony Wong, Jeannie Kilroy Wilson, Jane P. Watkins and Helen D. Buchanan, the Henry Luce Foundation, and an anonymous donor. Many other donors contributed as well, some of whom are here tonight, including the Ballou family, John and Judith Herdeg, Linda H. Kaufman, Arthur Liverant of Nathan Liverant and Sons, and the Friends of American Arts at Yale. I extend sincere thanks to you all on behalf of uh, the gallery and Yale University. Thank you. I also want to express my sincere thanks and heartfelt admiration to Patricia Kane, the gallery's Friends of American Art Curator of American Decorative Arts, who de dedicated years of detective work, connoisseurship, and scholarly research to organizing this exhibition. Of course, an undertaking of this magnitude requires a real team effort from every corner of the museum, and Pat, as you all know, is an extraordinary leader for that team. Um, but I want to recognize the enormous contributions of many, many gallery colleagues who've been essential to making this exhibition a reality. So thank you to you, Pat, and thank you to all of our colleagues here. The lecture honors the memory and career of Oswaldo Rodriguez Roque, who graduated from Yale College in 1972 and then received an MA from Yale in 1975. Oswaldo was the Associate Curator of American Decorative Arts at the Metropolitan Museum before being appointed the first Executive Director of the Chipstone Foundation in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He published widely on American painting and decorative arts, including American furniture at Chipstone, and Directions in American Painting, 1875 to 1925. Following his early death in 1990, a lectureship fund was endowed with a generous gift from the Chipstone Foundation and with contributions from friends, family, and colleagues. The Rodriguez family have been loyal attendees of these lectures, and we are honored to have Oswaldo's sister, Alicia, and his niece, Allison, with us tonight. Over the past 24 years, the Oswaldo Rodriguez Roque Memorial Lecture in American Art has brought many of the leading figures in the field to New Haven, and this year is no exception. Philip D. Zimmerman, PhD, is a museum and decorative arts consultant, author, teacher, and appraiser based in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. He also happens to have been a classmate of Oswaldo at Yale receiving his BA cum laude with a major in philosophy in 1972. He received his PhD in the American and New England Studies program at Boston University in 1985. And before forming his own business, serving institutional clients and individual collectors, he was director of the Museum Collections Division at Winterthur. That was from 1986 to 1992 executive director of the Historical Society of York County from 1983 to 86, and curator of the Courier Museum of Art in Manchester, New Hampshire from 1979 to 83. Current teaching appointments include adjunct faculty in the Appraisal Studies Program at New York University, and Pat Kane tells me that Philip regularly brings his NYU students each time he teaches a course for a day-long session in the furniture study. He's also a visiting scholar at Franklin and Marshall College, where he teaches museum mysteries, of course I certainly want to take. Um, and formerly, he was visiting professor at the Bard Graduate Center for the Studies in the Decorative Arts. He's the author of several books and catalogs and many articles and book reviews. And his topic tonight 
is Studying American Furniture in the Present. Welcome, Philip Zimmerman. Thank you, Pam, and thank you, all of you. This symposium, the exhibition that occasioned it, and the Yale Rhode Island Furniture Archive testify to our 100 plus years engagement with early American furniture, of which Rhode Island work represents a formidable, sometimes obsessive part. Whether one pursues furniture from Rhode Island or other regions, a brief look back at our century of study suggests today's opportunities and needs. I join many others in identifying those earliest and unabashedly enthusiastic furniture scholars as forming an antiquarian age. Antiquarians as a people are usually described as, as participatory rather than objective. They are the ones who literally dress the parts and seemingly want to play by the rules of the past that they uncover. While researching the chair pictured in this 1896 book of photographs, I found a 1913 American Homes and Gardens magazine reference that said, originally it stood in the house of Moll Pitcher, the famous soothsayer. There it attracted the attention of many distinguished persons, some of whom undoubtedly sat in it. Participatory indeed. Many publications and museum exhibitions nourish this antiquarian age, contributing enthusiastic attributions of the newly discovered furniture to newly identified furniture makers. The 1913 edition of Luke Vincent Lockwood's American Furniture Book included the first publication of a furniture maker's label, which happened to be that of William Savory of Philadelphia. That discovery inspired curator R.T.H. Halsey to attribute to Savory essentially all of the Pennsylvania Chippendale style case furniture at the Metropolitan Museum in his 1918 Met Bulletin essay. Not to be upstaged, Samuel Woodhouse and others associated with the Philadelphia Art Museum found and published through the 1920s more labeled savory furniture and attributed yet more undocumented examples. Perhaps the highlight of all this enthusiasm was use of yet another attributed savory piece to help sell Seagram's gin which appeared on the back of a 1947 issue of Newsweek magazine. And thank you, Jay Stevel, for this reference. <laughs> this age of furniture history brought us savory. Benjamin Randolph of the famous sample chairs, Duncan Fife, the Seymours of Boston, the Goddards and Townsends, and several other names and documented examples from populated centers throughout the Northeast. These antiquarians launched our field along a trajectory that we still follow. In 1952, the Winniture Program in Early American Culture was established, the first of several graduate programs to focus on American decorative arts and material culture more generally. These programs professionalized the field and opened a new era. Each year, graduate students went out into the field in pursuit of a master's thesis. If there was a typical study, it investigated an account book or other body of manuscript evidence, a few documented pieces of furniture or other decorative arts, provided uh, uh, biographical and other contextual history, and attributed additional objects to that maker. As Ned Cook of Yale later observed, these studies chronicle furniture forms by single makers. Another investigatory model generated lists of craftsmen in particular area or, uh, areas or communities and made interpretive remarks accordingly. The impact of all this work was to uncover more furniture and evidence and to impose greater order and footnotes on what had come before. By the 1980s, unstudied account books became scarcer along with related bodies of documented furniture. The number of studies that came out of these professionalizing decades is prodigious and their scope extends much farther than the Northeast target of antiquarians. And they extend well beyond Winneter. Field research and regular publication by the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts comes immediately to mind. The Deerfield Summer Program, which started in 1956, Cooperstown in, in 1964, 
Boston University programs, and of course Yale, are just some of the participants that characterize this time. One of the more significant studies, at least measured by the long-term high price of the catalog, is Yale's 1982 card table study, The Work of Many Hands, by Ben Hewitt and others, including Pat Kane, who, in, uh, who included 374 federal card tables in a broadly conceived regional study based on quantitative analysis by computer. I will return to the card table study, but let's first address the present age. No obvious demarcation separates it. Uh, it is just where we are now and where we've been in recent memory, say the last 20 years. On the one hand, we seem to have covered everything. If we haven't, we still have an answer for everything. Neither museums nor the marketplace want to present unique or otherwise unresolved pieces of furniture. In the old days, collectors sought the unique. Now they steer clear. Oddities or unknowns that come to the marketplace typically have missing information filled in with or without supportive evidence. Clearly, saying something is better than saying nothing. Museums leave such questions in storage. These objects do not necessarily represent questions of authenticity, but of historical context. Storage means, of course, that the rest of us, we, the interested public, are not invited to those conversations. And the object quietly sits and hopefully is forgotten. On the other hand, and there is another hand, we have achieved a level of sophistication in our studies that invites us to reconsider large bodies of furniture and accompanying furniture interpretations, and to revisit some of those nettlesome objects. This is precisely the time when we want to pursue those unknowns. Our opportunity today is based on unprecedented access to new evidence, better scientific analysis of physical properties of, the, of objects, and ever more accumulated knowledge and experience recorded each passing year in the bibliography of the field. Of these three enriched areas, time allows only passing mention of the multiple benefits of many scientific analyses, which can independently support or contradict conventional interpretations. So we can't dwell on such examples as this desk and bookcase, offered recently by a major auction house as an 18th century Rhode Island slant lid desk with a 20th century bookcase top, added obviously in the 20th century. The dealer who bought it for a mere 40 times the estimated price had finished samples analyzed from both sections. Uh, the sample that I'm showing here is from another project, but it shows the kind of finished layering visible under the microscope. And if samples from two parts match, then those two parts had common histories. Uh, it is a pretty unambiguous test. The two samples matched, removing all questions about the bookcase section. Subsequently, Pat Kane and her colleagues examined it and found the signature of Ichabod Cole working in Warren, Rhode Island, and the date 1790. You can find it on the Rhode Island Furniture Archive, or RIFA as I call it, where it looks like the image on the right. Before moving on from the sciences associated with object study, I will mention two evolving procedures. One is dendrochronology. It is an old technique of dating individual pieces of wood based on growth patterns observed in tree rings, the thickness of which varies with changes in climate and other growing conditions. Known to work well in stable environments, such as the American Southwest, its usage is expanding. Some scientists have already used it on early European furniture, such as this circa 1580 cabinet at the Getty Museum, rescued from status as a fake. And dendrochronology figures prominently in identifying uh, fake Marie Antoinette chairs in a case unfolding now in Paris, in which the Louvre is finding itself involved. <laughs> the other procedure is new protocols for wood identification under development by the U.S. Department of Fish and Wildlife for controlling traffic in illegal trees, such as Brazilian road, rosewood. 
The great benefit here will be quick identification at the species level, not the genus level, but the species level, which will provide students of furniture an enormous boost in the accurate patterning of wood use, as it will distinguish among different kinds of pines, for example, and other species. But enough science. When this card table was auctioned recently, it was described in, uh, as signed and dated J. Bridge, 1815, and identified as the work of John Bridge of Boston. As you can see, the fixed table leaf is signed in chalk on the underside. I was asked to look at it. The obvious place was to start with the inscription um, and, and ask the question, J Bridge? It looks more like E Bridge. Was this a maker, a buyer, or a place? Of the many research tools available to us today, Google alerted me to the towns of South Bridge and North Bridge in Massachusetts. The only East Bridge uh, place name um, that I could find was in New Hampshire, but only named after 1815. E Bridge yielded the name Ebenezer of Harvard, Massachusetts in Worcester County, which in turn led me to this card table, similarly signed by J. Fairbank, no S at the end of Fairbank, also of Harvard. This table at Old Sturbridge Village is in an online exhibition catalog that likely would not have been publicly available without that inexpensive electronic resource. Direct examination of the Fairbank table revealed that it, uh, in a, that in addition to obvious design similarities um, and the placement of the chalk inscription, it too combined cherry legs with mahogany and mahogany veneer. Bridge, I learned, was born in 1788 in Harvard, Massachusetts. Fairbank, who of course was yet another Jonathan, uh, also was born in 1788 in Harvard, Massachusetts. But who made the table? Old Sturbridge Village had researched Fairbank's furniture making activity. I had to, I had to pursue Bridge. Although Worcester County archives are online, I went there to make sure that they hadn't left any records in old boxes. They hadn't. Uh, so, as they reminded me, I could have researched everything from my home. <laughs> Al although checking for incomplete records, uh, record conversion is still very necessary. Although I found no probate records, other records for Ebenezer confirmed that he was a Harvard farmer throughout his life. The bridge inscription then is a destination, not a maker. Ebenezer married in 1815, and I like to think that Jonathan, the local furniture maker, put a little extra effort into the table because he was Ebenezer's childhood friend. The new information about this card table, readily available today, represents the first of three categories of early American furniture study that I will pursue this evening. The first category adds to our corpus of information. It refines our understandings of related furniture. We now know a bit more about uh, the maker Fairbank, for example, and it makes everyone happy. My second category, and yes, this brings to mind Albert Sachs' good, better, best categories, is distinguished by more substantial and better revisions to our inherited concepts of American furniture. This block front desk and bookcase is loaded with hard or yellow pine and white cedar secondary woods. Both are alien to Boston, where appearances suggest it should have been made. Some of you will recognize the giant dovetail construction, which is characteristic of Boston work, that holds the mahogany base molding firmly to the case bottom. Uh, the case bottom, of course, should be white pine, but it isn't. It is uh, white cedar. Secondary woods strongly indicate that this desk and bookcase was made in Philadelphia, but that makes it a unique block front. And we don't like unique. <laughs> Turn to the Yale Art Gallery online database, search under white cedar, and up comes this chest of drawers, identified as from Boston. It also has hard or yellow pine. I now have two objects with similar anomalies. 
As online collection access to yet more objects improves in general, I expect to find similar instances, giving me a small but solid group, which is more comforting than a unique object. Regardless of our degree of comfort, it is clear to me now that these two case pieces are better understood as Philadelphia-made block fronts, which for those of you who may not know is heretofore a, an anomaly. Without Yale's readily available collection information, I'd have put the desk and bookcase into deep storage in my mind, where it would sit quietly, although hopefully not forgotten. This broad-based comparative research becomes routine given the formidable research tools available to us today. However, because its outcomes may revise or even contradict some aspects of furniture history, not everyone will be happy. Specifically, this desk and bookcase was deaccessioned from a museum collection about 40 years ago because it was thought to be a marriage. It was a problem and so was rejected. If the museum had known what we now know, they might not have gotten rid of it. Let me illustrate another manifestation of my second category. If we return to the many hands card table study, the 374 tables included in that, in that study sounds impressive. But given the ambitions of the many hands study, 374 card tables is far too few. That sampling characterizes 18 geographical groupings, which average about 21 card tables per group. But the groupings are not that lar large, nor even in terms of geographical scope or numbers of tables. On the one hand, Boston, Salem, and Newburyport are distinguished by 101, 48, and 33 tables, respectively. Those table samples help define the respective regional practices. But the Philadelphia area, which is demarcated with porous boundaries extending 35 miles in different directions, making it substantially larger than Boston, Salem, and Newburyport combined, has only 36 tables, in contrast to the 182 of those other three cities. Moreover, of the 374 tables, only 54 are documented to a maker or place meaning the vast majority were assigned geographical origins before the study, representing circular reasoning. The results are uneven. Today, in brief, we can readily redo that study using the hundreds more examples it needs by referencing databases on our iPhones. Of those, we will find many, many more bearing maker's labels and other maker documentation. Redoing many hands and other studies in no way diminishes them or unduly criticizes them. Instead, it re-energizes them and makes them ever more suitable to our current needs and standards. Our field is small, and we should celebrate multiple studies of similar topics. It gives us valuable comparisons and, and contrasts uh, in the ways we analyze objects and the results we derive from them. In the words of scholar Ken Ames, if it's worth doing once, it is worth doing again. All those marvelous databases that we can so easily access create a clear and obvious need for reliable information in them. Good images, good materials identification, good construction observations, and good associated histories such as ownership, maker identifications, and other. These databases and the researching audiences they serve will live and die by the care and resulting accuracy with which they are maintained. Monitoring the information that they provide is, in fact, the task of senior people in the field, not younger, less experienced people, despite their enviable computer skills. But researchers must beware. Regardless of how reliable a site might be, we still have to see the objects in question. There is no digital standard uh, excuse me, no digital substitute for all the nuances the real thing supplies. When I went on the RIFA site and searched card tables, 351 records came up, of which more than 150 were of the many hands federal style, in contrast to the 27 Rhode Island examples in that study. That alone tells us it's time to redo the study. Of those 27, one of my old favorites is this unusual six-legged example labeled by Stephen and Thomas Goddard of Newport. 
um, a favorite of mine, not because it's labeled, but, be but because it's simply 50% better than those four-legged ones. <laughs> the many hands and reefa entries tell me that this table is owned by the Met, and you can see it, oof, you can see it in the art and industry exhibition upstairs. The Met's easy to use and informa informative database tells me that the secondary woods are tulip poplar and chestnut. Many hands says white pine and chestnut. And Rifa says oak and pine. Hmm. Differences may represent better wood identification since the many hand study of 1982, but differences between Yale's Rifa database and that of the Met represent current differences of opinion. This discrepancy reminds us that we still need to examine the objects ourselves. So, read about wood differences on the internet, get a bright light, and look for medullary rays to resolve the chestnut and oak discrepancy. Medullary rays are these lines that are not present in the chestnut. And, you can look for resin canals in the tulip poplar or white pine discrepancy on the, on the right part of the screen. If do-it-yourself is not part of your research toolkit, ask a specialist as we could decades earlier, but my point here is that this information is readily available. And with it, we achieve a much more exacting regional profile than that profiled in many hands. The Rifa site also shows me seven additional six-legged card tables, where before we had one. I find this simply amazing. Seven of the eight, uh, uh, including the one that I was that they that they had in in the uh, in the study, seven of the eight look very much alike and are all attributed to Stephen and Thomas Goddard, presumably by the Rifa site administrators. More interesting. Field notes of Pat Kane and Jennifer Johnson exist for the data, uh, in the database for three of the seven tables. Those notes tell me that although these card tables look alike, they differ in construction details. On two of them, the curved shape of the table frame is made with laminations or layers of wood stacked and glued to prevent warping underneath the veneers. On the third, the maker made the curved shape by sawing channels into a solid, not laminated board, then bending it to shape. Also, one of the three, not the one with the saw curves either, lacks alignment or leaf edge tenons, as in this image from another card table. These little construction details are significant only to those of us who are trying to group or pattern this kind of evidence into what we like to think of as shop practices. So here we have a little instance of, oh my gosh, this is messy. What am I going to do now? <laughs> Should I put this idea in mental storage? Don't panic. This more nuanced description typifies the revisions integral to my second category of furniture study. And the complexities they generate are simply part of the excitement and, yes, the joy of present furniture studies. All of this additional information allows us to examine some of the methods and assumptions of furniture history that have existed for decades. What does a shop practice really mean? How consistent do patterns we observe have to be? Can our shop profiles, based on all this data, reflect some more individual human characteristics, namely those of the shop master? For example, he may be a stickler for consistency, or not. By looking very closely at the information we mine from objects, we may come to a tentative finding that some makers were simply less flexible in how they ran their shops than others. In my own work on the unforgiving Duncan Fife, I see such consistency inside and outside of his furniture that I readily imagine his hot breath on the necks of each of his workers, peering over their workbenches to make sure that they do everything precisely his way. The card table on the left is firmly documented to him by an 1815 bill of sale. The one on the right has no history. It is not a mate because of different carved details of the feet. Yet, 
every glue block to say nothing of wood choices and construction details is identical. Fife was the essence of consistency. Meanwhile, Fife's contemporary, New York furniture maker Michael Allison, did everything differently, seemingly every time. Consistency did not confine his character. These two chests of drawers uh, can each be identified his work by labels, yet each differs in basic construction and design details. Allison simply kept his hot breath to himself and left several fabrication details to his workers. We can study furniture at, with this level of nuance based on solid and available evidence. What a great time to be a furniture historian. But let me now turn to my third and last category, which goes beyond refining and or revising to correcting core ideas that may represent long and widespread beliefs. If we go back to those Benjamin Randolph sample chair attributions of antiquarian times, most scholars give little or no credence to the argument presented in the 1927 article, which assigns maker identity through questionable provenance. Yet, they continue to attribute at least some of the chairs to Randolph based on no other evidence, an assumption that subsequently impacts our other understandings of other furniture. Similarly, several savory attributions, sometimes downgraded to school of savory, are still advanced and accepted on the premise of lambrequins carved into the knees, visible on the right in this 1925 illustration. Of all carved cabriole legs, leg chair, excuse me, bearing savory labels, only one chair has lambrequins on the knees. The other ten do not. Neither do his five labeled rush bottom chairs and three case pieces with cabriole legs. All of this calls into question how characteristic that feature is. Comparisons between different lambrequin styles readily group them into three types, further undermining their soundness as a basis for attribution, and comparison of similar lambrequins bring to view another chair documented to a Philadelphia maker named Edwin Wright in a 1715 account book entry. But the power of repetition and the desire to attach the name of a known maker keeps Savory's name connected to lots of furniture, even when the consequence is to obscure and confuse rather than enlighten our understanding. Perhaps it is time to do things differently. We have in inherited scholarship that is impeccable and beyond a reasonable doubt. We have also inherited less than impeccable scholarship that survives by the power of repetition. We read citations of earlier studies in support of present attributions, yet some of these long-held traditions have no substantiating historical evidence. One of our great challenges today is to use our myriad research research resources to ferret out these weak links and correct the written record accordingly. We need to follow the evidence. And repeating something many times doesn't transform it into evidence. Here's a recent example of following the evidence. Kem Widmer and Joyce King's study of Salem cabinet maker Nathaniel Gould's recently discovered account books introduce a serious wrinkle into our long-held beliefs about furniture styles and how they may be used to date furniture. Based on account book entries, the authors find that Gould began making Bombay furniture from about, from about 1758 when his business accounts start until his death in 1781 at age 47. This all makes perfect sense. The first documented Bombay form by Benjamin Frothingham of Boston is this desk and bookcase inscribed 1753. But why, according to the account books, did Gould reintroduce block fronts for his best customers after 1770? This one is inscribed 1775 or 1779, it's unclear. Block fronts, as we all know, predated Bombay's, the earliest being the 1738 Job Coit uh, desk and bookcase and a desk signed by Richard Walker, which is datable around 1740. We used to say with such confidence 
that the Bombay was a newer, more fashionable form. And now we can't or shouldn't. So which of these two case pieces was made first and why? And what happens when we apply this vignette to more general practices of dating furniture by style attributes? Things get messy. Several years ago, a major New York auction house offered this nice oxbow chest. And let me interject here that I treat major auction house catalogs as part of the bibliography of the field. Um, understandably, the auction house promoted the maker's label, identifying it as the work of Jacob Forster of Charleston, Mass excuse me, Charlestown, Massachusetts. They also dated the chest circa 1770. Forster was born in 1764, <laughs> so he would have been six years old when he made it, one of, one of several child prodigies in the corpus of early American furniture. <laughs> Another oxbow or reverse serpentine chest of drawers sold in January 2014 and, and was dated 1750 to 1770. If we turn to readily accessible evidence about oxbow furniture and let it lead us, we discover that the earliest datable oxbow piece of American furniture is the MFA Boston chest on chest signed in 1780 by Nathan Bowen and Ebenezer Martin of Marblehead. If we go a step further and survey all datable oxbow forms to get a sense of when our undated examples might have been made, we discover that the next earliest is 1788. About 30 oxbow case pieces can be firmly dated by inscriptions and labels between 1788 and 1800, some of which are illustrated here, along with the 1792 newspaper advertisement um, uh, a woodblock cut in the top center. Why do we squeeze out the earliest possible dating for the furniture we research? This practice is widespread in American furniture history as it is in English. Earlier is perceived as better, more valuable, and it often trumps the weight of evidence. There are dozens of uh, there are dozens of evidence categories embodied in every piece of furniture to which we can add associated or extrinsic evidence, such as histories of ownership, usage in the culture, status, and of course, long-held axiomatic opinions. How do we choose what evidence to use and what to ignore? How about weighting the significance of certain pieces of evidence what about comparing or correlating different kinds of evidence? And on and on. Some psychologists identify very human inclinations to preference those pieces of information that are more familiar and that incline the researcher's results toward confirming existing or desired beliefs. I might have to rewrite that sentence when I try this again, but the point here that I'm trying to suggest is the psychologists are identifying an inclination of ours to pick and choose that kind of evidence that ultimately builds the case that perhaps subconsciously we want to come out of our research. Evidence that might introduce discord is given less weight or ignored. Psychologists call this confirmation bias, and I have to interject here that I actually heard on the radio coming out of Lancaster, Pennsylvania yesterday, uh, a radio announcer using the term confirmation bias, so I began to wonder whether I was just kind of uh, throwing my, um, um, myself onto a trendy wagon who had left the station, <laughs> except to, one has to remember I'm coming from Lancaster where it's new and different. So when we look at this oxbow chest made of finely figured mahogany and displaying a generous overhang of the top and blocked feet that follow the OG profile, we see Boston furniture, Boston Chippendale furniture at its best. Who would argue with that? 
understanding American furniture through the common convention of style history, which implies tentative, uh, tentativeness or exploratory ideas early in the style. It implies a brilliant middle that embraces the apogee of expression and a maturing, overly ripe, but downward sliding late stage uh, easily suggests a date of about 1770, the middle of the Chippendale period, for this beautiful and successful chest. And who is the best known maker in Boston at that time? Why, Benjamin Froth Frothingham. And there you have the identification that accompanied this object when, it, when a leading dealer first brought it to market. No one argues to the contrary because everyone wants it to be so, kind of a group confirmation bias. But no matter how badly we want something to be true, the object still cannot predate its latest feature, in this case, the oxbow front. And I put a little reminder to myself that it's still not true if we keep repeating it. Another battleground in the war between, uh, between confirmation uh, bias and allowing the evidence to lead lies in provenance and genealogy. Genealogy, perhaps, is the most meta of all databases. It has brought the possibility of learning intimate details of historic individuals, to say nothing of ourselves, into our everyday research. What might have taken weeks, months, and years can now be accomplished in hours. The best genealogical sites also provide scans of pertinent documents. Remarkable. So we can take a Massachusetts federal uh, tilt-top stand, or snap table, with a penciled name of, of Lydia Berry, uh, um, penciled in early script, suggesting a possible owner, and quickly discover only two candidates in eastern Massachusetts during the decades when this table was likely made and used based on its design and materials and construction. But with two names and no way to decide between them, we can't say who is the original owner. Next time, we should stop when we find the first name. <laughs> the, the problem with creating genealogy is that there are simply too many names and too little evidence documenting how particular things actually descended. This pretty geological tree, not a, ge not a geological, it's a genealogical tree, reminds us that with two parents, the number of direct descendants doubles as we go from generation to generation. If we assume a new generation every 33 and a third years, or six new generations in 200 years, we have 64 possible paths of descent, and that just takes us back to the early 19th century. Queen Anne and Chippendale furniture embodies 128 or 256 possibilities. And what if some distant relative bought or sold the object or gave it away? Historian Laurel Thatcher Ulrich has reminded us on several occasions that genealogy is constructed, not revealed. Its creation entails many choices, and without any questionable intentions on the part of the researcher, inevitably embodies some confirmation bias. We furniture historians simply have to be careful about how much interpretation we hang on the genealogy peg. One way to rectify confirmation bias, wherever it may lie, is to craft alternative viewpoints and test them. Genealogical findings especially need reinforcement by other evidence. In wrapping up, let me introduce one final anecdote. This is the big gorilla in the room, or the exhibition gallery, the Art and Industry of Rhode Island Furniture uh, exhibition and catalog. It is an obvious example of studying American furniture in the present. My experience with it, like yours, is cursory at this point but it readily illustrates my points. It exemplifies my first good category of adding new information to our body of knowledge with new makers and new objects. It hits the second better category of, revi of revising what we thought heretofore, 
Yale's own desk and bookcase now has Daniel Spencer's name associated with it rather than a generic Goddard and Townsend label. Along the way, those associated with the Art and Industry Exhibition and Catalog and the RIFA database have rescued specific objects from, uh, from obscurity. This one hidden in plain sight in the Van Cortlandt House in the Bronx, uh, which tests the effectiveness of some of our analytical methods. And the exhibition and catalog pushes further into the third best category by correcting some deep, deeper beliefs and assumptions. What strikes me at this early stage of digesting everything is that among other findings, the several authors have differentiated Rhode Island furniture making communities across the 17th and 18th century landscapes that for the most part did not exist before. Heretofore, everything had been merely Newport and occasionally Prov Providence. They have also repopulated Rhode Island with locally made 18th century framed, i.e. not turned, chairs, which in recent years had been reassigned Boston origins. And the authors have shown us that furniture makers with a variety of talents lived outside of Newport. And remember too, the RIFA database undergirds the uh, exhibition and catalog statements with an enormous amount of evidence and detail. A few, hour ago, a few hours ago, I threw out my grand conclusion. Let me leave you with this. This is a great time to be a furniture historian. There is so much information about early furniture now available that we will have to develop new ways to negotiate it, especially if we are to avoid the pitfalls of confirmation bias. Furniture history is showing itself to be very complex it will only get more so. I existing interpretations will change. Inevitably, we will have different, even contrary opinions, and we must learn to accommodate them as we talk through them. An agile and responsive publication format would be welcome in that conversation. And last, let me thank you all for coming this evening but the fun stuff is tomorrow, and I can't wait. Philip, thank you so much for that um, thought-provoking, thoughtful, so many of the, the messiness, I mean, all the problems we've confronted in doing this book came flooding back to me. <laughs> um, but uh, you give us hope, and I think, yes, it's a new age for the study of American furniture, and it's very exciting. Um, I'd like to invite you now to uh, a reception out in the uh, mayor lobby. Um, I'd also um, just like to tell you that the exhibition is open until 8 o'clock this evening. Uh, so if you haven't seen it yet or you uh, want more time in it uh, in the next couple of days, um, now's a good opportunity. Uh, you go out into the lobby and turn left through Ancient Art, take the central elevator to the fourth floor. For any of you coming to the symposium tomorrow, the registration opens at 8.30, and the welcome is at 9, and the first real talk is at 9.15. So if you want to not be there on the dot, um, you have a little wiggle room. So please, let's um, go forth, enjoy the reception, enjoy the exhibition, and um, it's going to be a wonderful day tomorrow for those of you who are staying. Thank you. <laughs>